Every revolutionary act is an act of love. And this is an act of love. Welcome, everyone. How's everyone doing? I'm a show promoter, so y'all have to do better than that. How's everybody doing? All right, settle down. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we're going we're gonna to go through, I'm going to introduce the lovely people in front of you. Some you know, some you probably don't. Um, I know I knew exactly one person on this panel prior to uh, doing this event, so I got to know a few people as well. Uh, sitting right next to me, Ms. Dara Beavis, uh, co-founder at Wise Inc., uh, self-publishing company, which, by the way, I'm totally hooking up with this chick afterwards because if you guys know anything about publishing, finding a self-publisher is like finding a piece of gold in the middle of an oasis, so highly agree with that. So yeah, let's give her a hand. Originally from DC, but we won't hold that against you. We won't hold that against you. Uh, to her side, Jeff Lynn, I'm gonna call you the tech guy. You're the tech guy on this panel. He owns a company called Bust Out Solutions, which we discussed that I thought had a different meaning prior to this. So it's a great, it's a great way to catch people. He builds uh, web and mobile apps, also important to business owners, especially if you're like me who knows nothing about technology. These kind of people are very important to your life. So let's give Jeff a round of applause. Oh, I almost forgot. My most favorite, uh, my most favorite note about Jeff is that he was on PBS's colonial reality show, Colonial House, and was there. Oprah Winfrey took over his bed while he was there, so he got kicked out, which I think is a dope <laughs> fact about him. Who else could say that? Can any, anyone else up here know. say that? Oprah's never right. taken over my bed. Uh, Joe Bernard from Huge Theater, hugely famous improv artist. I'm talking global. This isn't just, she's not just at comedy sports and that's it. That's all that's happening in her life. So please give Jill a round of applause. <laughs> and I intentionally put the, the young man on the end because I figure a good chunk of people have an idea of who he is. Mr. Brother Ali from Rhyme Sayers. <laughs> See, you, get, you don't even need an introduction. But for those who don't know you, like if my mother was here, she'd be like, I don't know who you are. So Brother Ali, highly respected hip hop artist. He's a speaker, he's an activist. He does more than the average human. So yes, another round of applause for Brother Ali. And this is, this is your panel. So uh, we're gonna jump right into it. We're talking about the resiliency that comes after success, and I think before any other question, I'd like to know what you guys think success actually is. So go for it, jump. That was funny, it, uh, years ago somebody asked me, how will you know when you're successful? And I was like, oh, <laughs> I thought I was already successful. <laughs> uh, I think you have to feel like you're, you have success at every point. Mm -hmm. Every point could be a point of success. And even, I've started doing something strange where I decided an event is a success before it happens. Uh. <laughs> so that whatever happens is a success. I think you get to decide. Waiting for the world to dub you a success seems like the backwards way to do it. Mm -hmm. right. well, kind of like how we were talking about before this panel. Is I've, I've actually never felt successful. Um, I felt like I've had little victories. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I got my three-year-old daughter out of the house and she didn't cry this morning. <laughs> and, when, and that was, <laughs> that felt, I, that was the best thing that happened to me all week. Yeah. Um, and that was, so success is, is a, I think, a bit of a, bit of a misnomer um, when you think of like, as you journey through life, you have moments that are great and you have moments that you want to work through. Um, I feel like uh, it's just a journey. Right. Daughter, Ali. You know, for me, I the first time I felt really successful was when I quit my job <laughs> <laughs> and decided to uh, be an entrepreneur. I was like, yeah, I'm not doing what my parents said I should do. I'm not getting a paycheck. This is awesome. <laughs> I am, uh, you know, killing for my food. Um, and it felt successful for me because I was doing something that I wanted to do for me. And I felt al in alignment, I guess, with what was my purpose. Right. So that, for me, was successful. How about you, Ali? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, give a round yeah. of applause. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. This is great. I mean, I think it's really a matter of knowing what your purpose is and being really connected to what roots and grounds you mm -hmm. to what the reasons that we're actually doing what we're doing. Yeah. And I think that people who are connected to that passion 
um, on something bigger than just the ego level, yes. but really connected Amen. to a to a principal truth about yeah. that's at the deepest level of who we are. Mm -hmm. Then that keeps you um, constantly oh, at the same time feeling successful right. because even the desire to do something is a success in and of itself. Mm -hmm. The Muslims believe that the Creator, uh, for people who are connected, gives you those desires because the Creator has already written that you will have what you desire. Mm -hmm. So the, the entrance of the desire into the heart of a person that's rooted and connected is an announcement yeah. that, that it's already happened. Yeah. And so having that desire is a success in itself. So on the one hand, you're always successful, but then on the other hand, you're always driven Driving, at the yeah. same time. It's never, you're never done. Right. You're never, you've never completed all of your work and now you can just go die. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, so, so I think that having that, that, uh, that balance of, um, of being truly grateful to be doing the work that you're doing mm -hmm. and for everything that happens. You know, for me, when I bought a house, I, I never thought that I would buy a house. Mm -hmm. So when I bought a house from money that I made from making music, that felt like an enormous thing, but that that you know then you're all, all, automatically on to the next thing. That was like an outward kind of yeah uh, thing. A materialistic thing. Mm -hmm. If y'all tweet anything today, percipial truth might be the best. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best combination of words I've heard in a long time. So, mm. all right, so let's go to the weird interview part of this part. I say weird. I don't like. I like having a conversation with people, right? I don't be like, so when you were successful, what did you do to? No, I don't hate. I hate that part, right? <laughs> Who likes that? No one likes it. So we'll try and make it more comfortable. So, challenges. This is the part where resiliency comes in, right? What's like a major hurdle that jumped in front of you? Like I'm successful, and now a brick wall just dropped in front of me. So what's a major challenge that you've encountered in in your time, in your rise to the I top? I can tell you that. So I've been running my business for over 10 years now, mm -hmm. and the tech industry is, is very cutthroat. Um, yeah. There's a lot of money to be made. There's a lot of su success to be had. Um, and I'll tell you that the, the biggest challenge that I've encountered in the last decade is n nothing that I anticipated when I started my business. It's dealing with human dynamics. Um, and this is something that crosses industries, whether you're in tech or finance or music or art or education. You're, we're, we're dealing with people. Yeah. Unless you're you know, working in a Antarctica by yourself, like, you're going to interact with a human being. And just yesterday, we had some conflict between team members and clients. And, and I just said, I kind of wish I was just bagging groceries. Like, put my <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and there, there's moments where I'm like, I can't deal with the people. And then you're like, well, that's what we do. That's, that's all we do. You know, I could say that I'm a soft, I run a software company, but really I run a team mm. of people mm. and we work with people. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And what do you do to get around that? Um, it's honestly like I try and think about like how, this sounds funny, but I'm totally serious. I think about like how I interacted with people in middle school. Mm. Um, cause that's interesting. Yeah. I teach middle schoolers, so yeah. So you I, know what I'm saying. I feel you. Yeah, I think about like <laughs> what it was like being on a, a sports team in middle school, what it was like, uh, you know, dealing with like girls and boys in high school. And, and at that age, you act kind of out of your own, um, from your heart. Yeah, emotion. From your own emotion. And, and I'm like, all right, even as adults, we still do that. Mm -hmm. Whether you think you're professional or not, you're still acting like a human being. Yeah. Um, and you put yourself in that mindset, and it actually helps me solve problems. Okay. That's what's up. Very cool. For me, I, um, I don't know, is there, are there any book nerds in the room? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so you will get what I'm talking about. So I was, um, I have like two friends in school and used to eat my lunch in the library. So I have a business, and that is terrifying. Mm -hmm for somebody who was a book nerd. And, uh, and it sounds like I'm crying, but I'm not, I swear. <laughs> so for me, the challenge is like not seeing the girl in the mirror with like right. the big pink plastic thick frame glasses yeah. who had two friends. Like every day people say, you are doing stuff amazing. And I'm like, really? Cause I don't, it, the challenge for me is believing in right. me and knowing that I am amazing and our business is amazing and like having that confidence because I am that introverted book nerd with two friends. And now I have like, you know, 
500 authors who are friends mm -hmm. and um, in a cool office and Patrick who works for me is sitting <laughs> right there. Like it's, it's, it's it, for me, the challenge is me, like overcoming the barriers and the, and the limitations that like I placed on me. So, so now I do like this game where I wake up and I'm like, yo, you're gonna be bigger than Jeff Bezos, yo. Like you are gonna be like, like that to you. Like yeah. I look in the mirror and I say, you don't, you are not that girl who had two friends. Like you yeah. publish, you rock, you are a woman, you're a black woman, you came up out of the hood. Like yeah. you are, you are Those owning it. Monsters. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like I, I got, like I have to like, my challenge is like fighting that, that, um, that limiting, thing, whatever that is, like 100%, that. 100%, I think all of us are entrepreneurs in our own right, right? And that's the worst part that people don't realize is we fight ourselves yeah. way more than anybody else fights us. Like yeah. being a woman in hip hop, let me tell you, <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy, right? Like it's yeah. not easy. It's not easy being a woman who owns her own publishing company. You gotta hype yourself up. Right, it's not, none of it's easy and no one's there to be your cheerleader but you. You're the only one who can make you go. When people are like, I don't know if I can do it. Do it. What else are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> and the money part for a book person, yeah. too. You know, the money's, numbers, the numbers. The the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, how about you? I would say um, I am, I'm the founder of, I'm one of the co-founders of Huge Theater, but I'm also an individual artist. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time, I, I actually had to write, a second mission statement because huge theater has a mission <laughs> statement and then I was like wait a minute what what's my mission statement mm -hmm. because I a, a, a huge portion of my personal resources in every sense of the word resource is devoted to huge theater and for a while at least at, at the start we're five years old now which is incredible for an improv theater that's like yeah. a million yeah. years old <laughs> that's a million years old a club. <laughs> and so and we're five years old now, and, and as time marches forward, I'm, I'm able to think more about me personally mm. and what I, as, as an artist, am, am driven toward and what I would like to do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just because you're sending the elevator back down doesn't mean you can't keep climbing floors. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. I spend a lot of time figuring out um, how to delegate, how to give people the chance to take the responsibility yeah. so that I can go away mm. and not be physically present mm. at the theater, but still know that the mission of the theater is in good hands and is moving forward too. Delegate, I like that, that's important. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. do that. How about you, Ali? Mm. Um, I, I would think that my major uh, challenge in just continuing and moving forward has been that uh, to have a goal and to somewhat reach that goal and then question it and to, to be, you know, as you're achieving that goal, you also grow. And so your idea of what your goals really are and like what your real purpose is gets even deeper. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of, you peel back layers um, and realize that, you know, there's, there's something even deeper that I need to do here. And a lot of times that can mean um, questioning the success that I, I built, you know, um, so to build a fan base and then I've, I've had moments where I realized, well, what's, what's really being taken from the music that I'm giving or the, mm -hmm. the message that I'm offering? How am I being used against what my purpose is? Mm -hmm. I, I came into hip hop because uh, being an albino kid, um, I was completely on my own mm -hmm. and black wisdom elders and the black wisdom tradition saved my life mm -hmm. and led me to Islam and the, so the Islamic tradition and the black tradition made me who I am and it's the only reason that I, that I live. I don't, I don't wanna do, I don't wanna breathe doing anything else mm -hmm. than serving those things and pursuing those things and benefiting from those things and benefiting those things. And so, um, you know, there was a point where, you know, in hip hop when I was a kid, like I just wanted to be heard. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be recognized yeah. as that, yes, you can, yes, you're good at this. And then, so then you have, I had moments where my heroes actually did that. And uh, you know, so I built a fan base, or we built a fan base, and Rakim took me on tour for a year, and Chuck D is a really, you know, a mentor of mine. Yeah. And I, he's on my records, and I'm on his records. Mm -hmm. um, and we're able to do goals that I looked at, outward goals, like I would really love to sell out First Avenue. Yeah. 
and then, you know, and then I'll, it'd be nice to sell it out twice in a row. Yeah. And it'd be nice to sell it out, you know, the, yeah. all these different things. And, um, but uh, I realized that a, a, por a, a large portion of the people who were listening to my music and appreciating it outwardly were actually in their mind were using me against my purpose. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they were connecting with me. So they liked seeing a person on the stage that looked like them. Um, and that's a 500-year-old phenomenon mm -hmm. of uh, particularly white people liking to see themselves do something that they don't think they're supposed to be able to do. Wow. And, and when they see somebody wow. do that well, wow. they automatically, this is the best person that's ever done it. Yeah. And um, so, and, and then I found myself, regardless of the, you know, so that was a thing to wrestle with at first. And then a mentor of mine, who's Shakam Kali, I Self Divine, um, said, okay, this, this is good. You can use this to teach and to offer something to the world. Yeah. You have experiences that your fans don't have. Yeah. You have access to truth that your fans don't have. Yeah. So you have to figure out how to love them and how to te teach them that in a way that they can a actually get it. So then I start trying to tell those things and say them in a way that's appealing to people. Mm -hmm. But one of the key functions of privilege is that you hear the parts you want to hear, yeah. and you just discard <laughs> the, the parts you don't want to hear yeah. because you have no consequence yeah. uh, in a worldly sense. You have utmost consequence mm -hmm. inwardly. Right. Uh, these people are not human, and they d some of them know that, and some of them don't know that. Yeah. And ultimately, that's what brings them to original people's culture, mm -hmm. that they want to be connected to something more genuine than human. They know that. That's why people who, um, you know, white people who lost their culture when they stopped being German and Scandinavian and, and uh, you know, and became white. Yeah. They lost their tradition. They lost their language. They yeah. lost their connection. They start thinking they're better than their ancestors. Um, and so they, they missed out. They're missing a, a connection with their humanity. So that's why they go to original people's yep. culture. That's what draws them to it. Um, but so, I, so at a point I realized, like, all these people are clapping, and that feels good. Yeah. And all these people are connecting with certain truths. Like, so when I'm talking about my human, uh, you know, as a person, I feel this. I went through a divorce and I feel this. I have these uh, triumphs and I have these fears and, and yeah. pains and et cetera. And they connect with those things. And that's very real. Yes. But on the other hand, I'm being used against my right. purpose. And so um, there are times when, I, I, you know, trying to navigate that has been uh, a, a little tricky. Right. Because, uh, so I say, okay, well, if I say it nice, yeah. you're going to turn it into what you want to hear. Right. You're going to turn it into, if I say, hey, let's all rejoin the human family. Brother Ali saying post-racial colorblind. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm inviting you to be a human being again. Yeah. And you have to learn how to be a human yeah. being from the people who never lost their humanity right. in your wow. project of trying to rob everybody of their humanity. You only lost wow. yours. And so... Um, uh, so then I made an album that was like a little beating them over the head more. You, yep. you, can't, you can't be indirect with certain people. Yeah. And then they just decide that, well, yeah, we don't buy this one. Yep. And we don't go to your shows now. Yeah. And we're sick of this. We're tired of this. And I'm, you know, and I messages every day, I'm not following you anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and I've, I've seen that happen. And, but the worst part of it to me was that there was a point where I actually started to question myself. Right. That, that I, for a moment, I almost f fell into yeah. despair and believed that, uh, that what these dominating people yeah. say, yeah. these dominator people, that yeah. the, what they say about the world is true. Uh, because you see so much evidence of it. Yeah. You know, uh, Macklemore is a confused student of mine. Yeah. And he <laughs> won a Grammy and pretends he doesn't remember me yeah. now. Um, wow. But you know what, I think... Wow. Let's, and let's and get, so watching, watching yeah. that happen made me feel well, like, damn, you become, am, am yeah, I you, crazy? You hit a different, you hit a haze almost. And I think this is a perfect way. Wow. Y'all give it up to Ali for that story. Brother. Wow. I think, this, I think that's a perfect tie into the next, the next idea, which is, so we all have achieved these levels, mm -hmm. right? And we've gotten to these levels. And people think, like you're saying, people see you in a certain way. They see how you want it, they see you. And some people see you like, a, oh, you drive a nicer car now. You got it like that, right? Mm -hmm. you, you live in a doper house now. You got it like that. You, you, uh, 
you run a fe- like I get the oh you run a festival you must be popping right, right, right. <laughs> for real you are rich I, yeah you're rich right people walk into my crib and be like look at all this art you're rich yeah because I support black artists that's the art you're seeing on my wall right. you know yeah. and I do what I gotta do yeah. but it doesn't mean I'm rich right. I'm as broke as the next joke so you know it is but but they see us in a certain light you get seen in a certain light just like you were saying right so the question then is you get to this level, right? You get certain freedom, you get certain constraints. There's these, this give and take, the, my mother always called it the heaven and hell, you can't have one without the other, right? Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. So my question to you, have you found new challenges that come with having these freedoms or these constraints? Yeah. And then also, are they just, what I love how Susan wrote this, I don't know if Susan <laughs> wrote this. She said, or are these just good problems to have? I love that question. So, yeah. How about, you know, I'm going to start with Jeff on this one. You know, I, I reconnected with an old colleague of mine just last week. We went to the local, had some beers, and he and I had both graduated from college and entered the tech industry with pretty much zero experience. Um, so we were just pretty m- we were just young and dumb. Um, That's where it always starts. Yeah. I, well, I still am. So yeah, same here. Less young, still dumb. <laughs> um, but we, we kind of parted ways, uh, and then you know he, he went on to one career path. I started my business, and then we reconnected last week. And then he sent me an email, and he said, well, it's really good to see that you haven't changed uh, despite all your success in the tech industry. And that really struck me first as odd, uh, because like I said earlier, I don't feel, I don't feel like I've made it. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, why would I change? Um, one of the things that we, that I preach to my team all the time is we're not going to do work unless we find it fun and interesting and exciting because the second that work feels like work, then we don't want to do it. Um, and it's, it, that ties into the whole work life balance, which I'm sure a lot of you have like mm-hmm. kind of either struggled with or talked about. Um, I disregard it completely because I, my work is my life, and my life is my work because I love what I do so much that I don't want to feel like, oh, I need to put that away so I can live my life. Mm. Um, the two, for me, are one and the same, and it's good that way. Mm. Um, success for me is, is, is really, the, the best indicator for success for me is how happy do I feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that could mean my, my success with my company, success with my wife, with my kids, with my family. Um, can I pay the bills or not? And even, th- even then, it doesn't, you know, the f- financial success doesn't really tie into emotional happiness. Mm-hmm. Um, I work with a lot of people who have found m- huge financial success in the tech industry, you know, and I'm I, like, I'll meet with people who are 100 millionaires mm-hmm. and they hate their life. Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm glad I'm not you. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm driving my 2000 Honda Accord and I live <laughs> in a tiny house in Uptown mm-hmm. and I love it. And I'm so happy. And you're a bazillionaire, and you hate your life. Mm. Ali, you want to go? Since I was breathing. Well, so so yeah, that that whole idea of like the perception, um, like I'm not sure, like yeah, the, the idea that the perception that you're successful and like what comes along with that and the way people perceiving you changes. Um, I think that all of us that do this, we have to have some sort of belief system in terms of what we believe about the world. Mm-hmm. that keeps us attached to what we're doing and keeps us going. And that system, whatever, it, what, however we define it or whatever uh, we think it is or whatever language we put around it, whatever frames we put it in, we have to have some concept of the way that we interact with the universe and there's gotta be something bigger than just me and my ego versus these people and their egos. Mm-hmm. And um, so you know, if these people don't understand what I'm doing, I'm doing this for some other you know, bigger, thing and so knowing what we believe about that you know I think is really important and key and having some language around it and finding some language that makes sense to us is for me has been really helpful yeah Mm -hmm. Um, (coughs) I I think I can explain where I am (laughs) professionally by saying last month I made two million in Colombian pesos (laughs) 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 Which is six six hundred dollars. <laughs> um, which is six hundred dollars, and covered my airfare to Colombia. Um, 
<laughs> I, am, I am now internationally where I was nationally in 2002. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so like there's this huge gap and everything that's happened to me internationally has this funny familiar feeling of like, oh, I just got $600 to fly over here. Right. Um, and in a way, that's, that part is entertaining. Like, oh, I've been here before. Oh, yeah. I've, I've made ramen in a hotel coffee pot yeah. before. Yep. You know, <laughs> I've, I've been here before is kind of entertaining me right now. I don't know how long that will be true. Um, but I think it's also, in a way, it, it, it was also uplifting to me to point out how far I've come as a national artist, right? Mm -hmm. Like, nobody would pay me $600 mm -hmm. nationally. I would do much better than that. So, and I have the curiosity about, about improv comedy internationally that I had nationally back then. Mm -hmm. So it, it feels like an exact reboot. Like I'm completely rebooted and starting from scratch yeah. internationally in a couple of ways. Also because the kind of work they're doing in other parts of the country uh, and other parts of the world is baffling to me. It took me two and a half hours in Colombia to figure out what I could tell them that they did not already know better than I know it. Mm -hmm. um, not just the language barrier, like they're speaking in a different language with their bodies mm. and with their experiences and with the way that they tell stories. Like all of the people that do improv comedy there are also circus performers. So like what? I can't do, I can't do what you're doing. Mm. Um, so it took me a long time and that, it was scary in a way. I haven't been scared, mm -hmm. a, a good kind of scary. There's a good problem, like There's being scared yeah. again, like, mm -hmm. oh shit, <laughs> I really don't know yeah. what I'm talking about. And I also don't know the words for what I'm talking about because my Spanish is terrible. This is great. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's always fun, at least in the, in the field of art I am in, it's important to always be a little bit scared. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. to be scared mm -hmm. again, the way I was in <laughs> 2002, like, oh, it, it, in a way, I, it's fatiguing, but in yeah. another way, it's the best. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Wise Inc. started as a blog in 2012. And uh, it literally was me and one of my closest friends um, deciding that we were really bored at work and let's start blogging. And um, it was exciting and fun. And then we were like, oh, we got five followers. We got, we got <laughs> now we got 10 people. Oh, now we got 20 people. And then like a year later, we had 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. And so what I've learned is that there's these stages in my career that happen. And, and, the, and they always shock me because again, I'm looking in the mirror and seeing the pink glasses. And so <clears throat> now I'm at this stage where, so we left, we left that company, we started Wise Inc. in 2013. We had 10 authors, then we had 15, then we had 30. Now we work with over 150. And uh, now our, our good problems are um, that people are paying attention to our message around um, being a purpose-driven author, um, you know, writing the book and, or many books that you're meant to write. And uh, we would rather work with, you know, a hundred amazing game changers than put a million books out there that are crap. Mm -hmm. And so that message is resonating. And so now um, we're trying to figure out, okay, now we have, now we have buy-in. So now what do we do? Um, and so that constant level of pushing yourself to, to be, to be better, to give more, to, 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 to reach deeper, to, to, um, because we don't want. Patrick blogging because he's bored. <laughs> you know, we want to we want to keep we want to keep um, challenging ourselves to be the best and uh, and to create the best and what hasn't been created that we can create. So that's that's intimidating. That's an intimidating feat to figure out um, how can this indie publisher in Wise Inc. Um, that's one of the fastest growing publishers in the country be um, be on a level of of Twitter and be on the level of of the people that I respect and admire, how can we surpass them? And that's, that's, that's a good problem and, and it's, it's, it's intimidating, it's scary. Yeah, but, but that fear is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, just yeah. to echo what, what you guys are saying is, like, feeling 
stable is not really something that drives me personally. Like I don't. I, like <laughs> you want to be. You want to feel. I mean, you want to feel like you've accomplished something, but yeah. at the same time, um, you're not resting on laurels. Right. Like don't rest day. and don't rest because you're f afraid of failing. Mm -hmm. Like get to that point where you feel like you're back in 2002, yeah. um, because that's how you keep your life interesting and how you excel to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I never want to be bored. Right. And, um, and creating from that place too is yeah. that's where some of your best stuff lives and breathes in that six hundred dollar <laughs> yeah. state of mind. And I think if you all if you feel like you're on the brink of failure, that really is a motivating factor to, to like, oh, I could fail tomorrow, so I'm gonna work my ass off so that doesn't happen. Yeah, and I I consider myself newly successful. You know how you hear mm -hmm. new money. I consider myself fairly newly successful and I find it terrifying. Yeah. I find yeah. people who will find me. I was shopping at, uh, in a shoe store the other day and a homeboy came up and like shook me, like oh, shook my wow. shoulders. And he's like, you do for the love. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit. And I know Ali's been in the game for a minute. So people come up to you. I heard a really good story about you in a Waffle House once. I'll tell you about it. But anyways, uh, people will come up to you. <laughs> People will come up to you and you don't understand that they're coming up to you to appreciate what you've done. Mm -hmm. And it's terrifying to have, especially I'm like you, I'm very, I like being behind the scenes. I enjoy <laughs> being behind the scenes. I know I put off a persona of like, I love being on stage. I know, I feel you. I'm just good at it. Uh, and humble too. That's yeah, what my mom always says, and humble yeah, too. Are. But I like being behind, I like being behind the, the scene. And so when people recognize your success in whatever way they do it, yeah. be it an article or just coming up to you in a shoe store freaking you out, because that then makes other people notice you. And they'll be like, who is this chick? So then and then I turn into my old I grew up a hustler. I don't know about y'all. Like I'm not. I am educated and I do have a background where I've, I've been, you know, I've worked hard, but I grew up hustling. I grew up hustling jobs and doing everything I could to get where I needed to be. And so I automatically turn into a hustle mode like, oh, you know who I am now? Can I get 20% off this? <laughs> <laughs> so just knowing what you got to work with and using the, right. you know, using right. what your That's success right. has gotten you. Yeah. Like, and like you were saying too, yeah. Ali, about making sure that people's, ideas of you don't get screwed up. Like you are the only one that can control your message. You have to be really careful about how that message gets put out there into the world. So um, uh, the most, the one of the questions that we, we had on our list that I thought, and I know, I, how are we doing on time? Who's in charge of me on this? It's a bunch of people shaking their head back I'll, there. I'll be in We're charge. Good. You're in charge? I don't even know what time. I'm not good at that part. But anyway, so, uh, but one thing I wanna make sure we um, can cover just because there's a lot of young cats in here, and uh, Ali was talking to Susan about this, is you can only be new once, is something you have said. Mm. So what is something that you have learned or understood that you wish you would have understood earlier in, in this process? I think that could be really helpful to everybody. Mm. Anyone? Trust. Trust that it'll work out. Trust that your art is um, you are the best person to create the art that you're creating. Mm -hmm. Trust that you can do it. Trust that um, if you don't make a single cent, didn't mean that it wasn't meant to be. Trust that um, the money will come. Trust that people will love what you do. Trust that you will be okay no matter what. Just trust. Yeah. yeah. I agree with what she said. <laughs> I mean, I, I think for me it's a little different. Like, uh, you know, if you're if you're if you've got a million followers, which I don't, <laughs> but if you have a million followers, you can only be new once, and yeah. and everyone knows you, right? Everybody yeah. knows who you are if you're on stage. Um, if you're not in that type of a business, if you're you know uh, somebody who's in a classroom or somebody like in my case running a small business. Um, I can be new every week because I meet people who have never heard of me or have never seen me before. Um, I, somebody asked me how my startup was going, and I said, startup? What startup? <laughs> like, I've been around 11 years. I mean, we're older than Facebook. Old, you know. well, that's right. Um, that's right. But, but don't forget that, you know, given your, whatever endeavor you're, you're pursuing, you may have the opportunity to be new every day. 
That's a great point. Yeah, yeah that's a great point. And I, I've, I've definitely experienced, um, uh, you know, there's a there's a, a moment with me where I, I had like a kind of like a breakout moment. And so like it's weird because I kind of track it like there is, it's no more obvious to me as a musician than it is at South by Southwest. Like I've been to South by Southwest every, I don't go every year, but you know, m most years for like 11 or 12 years. And um, I remember going there when I was not recognized by anybody and trying to get something. And then there's one year where everybody decides that you're hot this year. Yeah. And then you perform 12 times and you do 37 interviews and like everybody wants to talk to you. And then, and then the, literally the next year you come back and it's, you're right yeah. back to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, we talked to you last year, you know. It's interesting, though, that um, we were, Rhyme Sayers had a 20-year anniversary showcase down there, and then there was another level of conversation that was yeah. happening, similar to this yeah. one, about mm -hmm. how do you keep going after yeah. that. But, but what you're saying, too, is really important that, that um, you know, I constantly run into people, um, like sometimes I won't perform for a while because I'll be, you know, studying Islam or just actively organizing, doing something else, and then I'll have a show somewhere and I haven't even thought about my music in mm -hmm. three months, uh, which is not good to do that. <laughs> but that's just the reality of it. I haven't thought about my music in three. Kevin's looking at me like, man, we haven't. <laughs> 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 Kevin is one of my bosses at Rock Series. Like, you go another year without an album, you're officially retired. Yeah. Um, you hear nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, they give me a hard time about that. But uh, they're also very supportive, too. Um, but. The, uh, but yeah, so then I'll, I'll go and I haven't thought about my music, but it's still circulating. So once you do work that exists in the world, it's yeah. always benefiting yeah. you. Yeah. It's there, yeah. you can't, like nobody can take away the fact that you did that That's thing. That's a good point. Um, and so, you know, that does, so I'll go and do a show, uh, we did something at the Kennedy Center for the last Eid, and, um, or no, the, the one before the last one. And I hadn't, like I said, I, I had been traveling, I hadn't, thought about my music in a couple of months. And there were all these like brand new fans there and all these new listeners and stuff that had like driven from other cities and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's a really great point too about the fact that because, be, you know, there's, there's definitely a tipping point where, you know, when you're, when you're growing, the only people who know who you are and what you do are people who like what you do yes. or are interested yeah. in what you do. Yeah. Um, and so you watch people grow through that, but then there's a tipping point where everybody knows you, whether they like you and find you beneficial to them or not. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you turn into Kanye West and you have like the whole like, everybody knows you, even the people that wish they could not know you. No. <laughs> um, but if you never hit that point, then you're always new to somebody and um, you're always, you know, fresh yeah. in some kind of setting. Yeah. And then you get these new pockets, like my book just this month was translated into Romanian. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so like now there's a bunch awesome. of people in Romania yeah. sending me broken English Facebook messages <laughs> about how much they like the book. Um, and I haven't read the translation, nor could I. Um, so it might be horrible. Um, um, <laughs> they love it. I'm sure that they're like, Yo. thank you. Like, okay. You have, um, you have the best outlook out of anyone in my life. Yeah, I had this. I had a Skype call, and there were all these Romanians being quiet in a room, <laughs> trying to listen to me speak on a bad Skype connection. I was like, I hope I, I hope I sound okay, and I'm hope I'm being translated okay. Right. Um, but I was, I was gonna say, like, I feel, Dara, my uh, my journey might be opposite of yours because yeah. um, I think when I was younger. I thought people wanted me to be very extroverted, and I thought I had to be the life of the party, and I thought I had to be big and funny. Like, I had this idea of the funny girl that was huge, mm. um, and I, I would drink a lot and stay up later than I wanted to, and, I, I, and uh, it took me a long time to realize that I am the girl in the library, <laughs> alone in the corner. <laughs> um, and I th so that's, essentially just being true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you might not know at the beginning what yourself is. Uh, you, you were describing a little bit of this. Like um, when I started, I, st I started improv when I was 21 and I was still very much a teenager in mm -hmm. a lot of ways mentally. And I still very much needed the love and attention of a room full of people uh, that I didn't know to applaud for me and laugh at me. 
Um, laugh at me. I didn't care. <laughs> laugh at me. I like the sound. Um, and it took me a good decade to realize, mm -hmm. uh, to, to cool it in that mm -hmm. regard mm -hmm. and get to enjoy it for the art and get right. to create work for the sake of the work and for the sake of what I want to say as opposed to creating work exclusively so that a room full of people will love me. Yeah, I feel you. Yep. Don't, don't, yeah, give that a hand. Don't love me, what are you doing? You're ruining it. <laughs> That's kind of why I wanted to give you a hand. <laughs> I'll play the devil's advocate. The only, the only piece of advice that I'll give everyone is I, I give every promoter, fail gloriously. Amen. I have failed everything I've ever done, and I've done it with so much style. <laughs> and I continue to, because it's just like you were saying, you know, the truth, tell the truth, don't care. If people, you're talking about don't care if people show up to your event, like just love your event, I love that. That's, it took me a long time to realize that. That, because I always, um, everybody who's done an event with me, Bianca's done events with me. That's the head of my photography right there. Uh, just so you know, the first hour of my event, don't talk to me, because I'm the most, I'm an asshole. Because <laughs> I'm like, no one's coming here. This is going to be the worst event ever. I don't even know why I put money in this. This is the stupidest idea. Everyone who said yes to me is the dumbest person on the planet. I hate everybody. <laughs> and then an hour and a half later, the place is packed. I'm like, yeah, it's the best event ever. <laughs> <laughs> so fail gloriously. Trust. So work, trust. <laughs> trust that you can fail, and it'll turn out. Uh, we're going to move to questions and answers and all that great stuff. I saw this mic. Yes. Hi, I'm Caitlin. Um, we have a standing mic right here, so if you're close to it, go ahead and line up there if you have a question. Otherwise, shoot your hand up, and I'll be over with the wireless mic. Cool. Mm, looks I, like like, I like that the first person that shot their hand up was one of the first uh, people I've ever uh, mentored. Yes. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right, peace. My name is Brianna Brilliant. Um, hello. Um, I'm not going to talk about myself, but <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you, Ali, for bringing that conversation into the room about the uh, original people and that that dialogue. I really appreciate it hearing that in this space. Um, and I have two questions. One, can you talk a little bit more about like ego and how do you differentiate ego from self and like what does that look like in the work, like when you're out here in the world trying to do what you're trying to do? Mm -hmm. And then my second question is for um, the rest of the panelists, especially people who are working in teams. Um, how, what are some advice or like fails and successes you've had in built, trying to build a, a powerful team? Mm -hmm. Who wants to touch ego? Well, those are related, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, those are related. Um, I, I, I started in acting, and in acting you're supposed to be competitive and care whether Jeff gets the part and you do not get the part, and I realized, um, Oh man, it's, D it's Deepak Chopra shit. Oh, <laughs> I realized that um, we're all the same thing. On an atomic level, we're all connected. There's no difference atomically between any of us and this table, and we're all the same thing. So if I have success, it's Jeff's success too. It's all of our success. If Jeff has success, I also have success. Uh, and I can be happy. If you get the part instead of me, then we got the part, and we're also sad because we did not get the part. We did <laughs> both. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We we so when I think of a team, we're all the same thing, and my mm -hmm. ego extends to everyone. Everyone is my boss, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I am everyone's boss. We're all the same thing. So my sense of ego extends to the the human race. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because we're all we're all the same thing. Right. Well, I and I, I I'm sorry not to cut you off. I ego is a big thing in hip hop, right? Like it's you have to have an ego, and I mean I joke about not being humble and the whole nine. But people who really know me know I care more about the people around me than myself personally. I care more that the people around me are taken care of, that they have the, what they need for their life. I'll always go without if it means giving to somebody else, and it's the way I operate. Because I think if I don't give to others, how can I ever expect to succeed? Because if I don't help Brie out in the, in the beginning and give her lessons that I knew, right? How would, she, how would I feel if she felt and it was something I could have helped her with, mm -hmm. right? 
that's how I look at other people around me. Like you, you have to be certain a certain kind of ego. I always call it the persona. You got to put the ego persona out there, especially when you're a business owner. Like I'm that shit, you know, fake it till you make it kind of thing. But what does your reality look like? Persona is just this perception. What's your reality actually? How are you actually existing within your skin? So, so I want to answer your question about building a team. Um, so my company is not, right now we're nine people. We've been as large as 18, um, but right now we're at, we're at a very steady nine solid team that's been around, that's been together for years. Um, and early on, you know, a decade ago, I wanted to build a team and I wanted to find like the best designer, the best programmer, um, and then there's, you know, there's egos involved uh, with that. Um, but then I, it took me a few years to learn this. Um, so, uh, what, I, what I basically boiled it down to was two rules for building a team. No assholes and no dumbasses. <laughs> and, and it's honestly like, you look, if you can satisfy <laughs> both of those, you're doing pretty good. Yeah, I'll give that a hand clap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, because the challenge that I, that I came, uh, was faced with was I would work with some people who were brilliant, like really, really smart way smarter than anyone I'd ever worked with, but they were assholes mm -hmm. and you couldn't work with them. Yeah. Mm. Um, so you had to, then I would work with people who were so awesome and I'd love to go drink beer with them and hang out and I want them to come over for dinner, but they couldn't get their shit done. Mm. Um, so then I'm like, wait a minute, I need both. You gotta have both mm -hmm. and yeah. you can have a balance of the two. That's good. So I think we're talking about that ego thing. I think we get back to the idea that uh, People who are thinking for themselves have to have, um, we all have some type of spiritual understanding, some type of metaphysics, some type of mysticism, something that we believe about the world. And that's, um, that to a degree flies in the face of what's popular and conventional right yeah. now. Yeah. We live in a society that tells us uh, <laughs> that, um, that everything is science that there's no interpretation, mm -mm. that any interpretation is just, you're just making that up. Right. Um, a, a, a really fierce kind of anti-spiritual mm -hmm. climate mm -hmm. um, to, to the point where they, you could be made to feel silly for having some sort of spiritual or metaphysical mm -hmm. understanding or ideology or, or framework. So regardless of what the framework is, whether you say it's uh, you know, uh, Deepak Chopra or, mm -hmm. or um, something else, my own personal one is Sufism. That's what I, that's what I believe in. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the idea that, um, and, and, and what the Sufis would say is that uh, everything is being controlled by the creator, by the meaning, whatever the, the meaning, whatever your language is you have for the cause behind all of this, um, the meaning, the purpose, the truth, the real God, Allah, whatever you believe that, whatever language you have for that. Yeah. And that thing is in control of everything. And so there's a difference between um, recognizing that, I've, that I have a gift and that my gift is very important and it's very uh, necessary. Yeah. And that uh, the creator chose to put me in this world with this gift and with this, this little piece of the truth that I have. And this is my job to do it. And it's, that thing is amazing. Ego, so there's no ego in that. I don't believe that that's ego. I think like the, you know, the, we're convinced that uh, we, we mix up lust and love. Uh, lust is false love. Mm -hmm. We also can mix up ego with, or what, with what we call confidence, mm -hmm. with just a sense of our own greatness that we've been mm -hmm. given as a gift. The difference is to say that I, this is important, mm -hmm. and this is amazing, and I am the, what, you know, I am the, you know, uh, but it's, I didn't create it. Right. And I didn't give it to myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And everybody that does something creative, you know that you're in a space where you you hit a wall and you you have a block or whatever, and eventually you just resign. Yep. You submit to I can't do this. I need whatever that cause and purpose is to give it to me. And then it happens. Every creative person has that moment. Mm -hmm. It has a, a lifetime of those moments. Uh, and so uh, that that thing and that thing that happens is um, that's from that source, you know. Right. And so uh, balancing the difference between the ego is when I think that it's mine, when I think that I own it, and when I think that it has uh, the difference between my gift being important and me being important, me, my low self being important, uh, 
you know, so, so if the people are clapping, it's because they are appreciating the truth that I've been given. And so the UPS woman or man, they are not arrogant about what they're delivering to you. But when they deliver something to you that you've been waiting for, you're, you're, it makes you very happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, uh, so, so they shouldn't think like, yes, I'm giving you the, the you know what I mean? Right, right. But what they're bringing is very important, and they ought to treat it that way. Right. Yeah. And so we're the UPS people of the gifts that we've been given it. by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's awesome. And, and <laughs> that's a very important job. Yeah. And so uh, if the people are clapping, it's because they appreciate what you've been given. Yeah. And if they're not clapping, it's because they don't appreciate it. It's not for them. And they don't get it. Or and that's, and that's okay. not your problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's not your problem. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so in building a team, just I want to say something really quickly about yeah, building yeah. a team, because the, the, the person who really makes Rhyme Sayers, uh, who holds it all together, the glue of it, is a person named Sadiq or Brent Sayers, for people who knew him before <laughs> hip hop. Um, and he is, a, is somebody who will, when he sees value in a person, he never lets them go. Mm -hmm. Even if they fail at 12 jobs, he will continue to move them to another job to try to figure out, I know there's value in this person. Right. And there are some, there are some people at Rhyme Sayers <laughs> that we've been intensely frustrated with. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and you say, no asshole. Somebody could be an asshole in one. I mean, an asshole is good for pooping. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, even an asshole has a job. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it just may be that, like, you know, and I've been very frustrated with people and hired people, and I've had people quit on me, and I think I'm giving them every opportunity. And I just realized I haven't, it's a, it's a key, it's a, one of the major gifts to figure out what is this particular tool's job. Yeah. This, this hammer should not be, you should, I should not be using this hammer to try to screw screws. Yeah. I should be using a screwdriver to screw screws. Right. I used to use this hammer for what, what a hammer is for. So uh, one of the things in team building that I've seen done well, and I'm not v always very good at it myself, is to, to really just figure out what this person's value is right. and, and what it is that they're able to. That's an excellent so point. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Dar, do you have, you have a good team builder? Yeah, I, our team is, um, is, we're a new team. so. We're probably still in the honeymoon phase of team. Um, we have been very lucky to, you know, Amy and I, my, my business partner, we found uh, two amazing additions to bring on. I've mentioned Patrick a lot. Patrick, you should just wave, just wave. He's wearing an yeah. awesome hey, Patrick. shirt. Um, and we, we um, have been really lucky. We ha we've had interns who basically um, will do whatever we want for free and they work um, their asses off to get books to press on time and to edit and, and edit again and then edit again and, and so we've been really lucky. I, I don't have much to add except for to say I've been really lucky. On the ego thing, um, I've worked with so many authors over the years. I can tell you that what I've learned about ego is that it's really courageous to be vulnerable enough mm. to get over yourself. Mm. And, um, and, and I don't know if I should say this, I'll, I'll just be honest. Um, it's, there are more authors who don't have that courage than, than those that do. Mm. To be vulnerable enough to get over yourself. But on the flip side, it is really fucking hard yeah. to do that. And to, um, you know, writing is, is one of the few arts where you're judged with the same art that you put out there. Yeah. So if you are a painter, you're not critiqued with paint. Oh, wow. when, you, when you write, you are critiqued you're with writing. somebody who yeah. might be a better writer than you. And that is just an incredibly vulnerable place to be. Yeah. And um, if, if you decide to write, if you decide to put your work out there for the world, um, thicken the skin yeah. and, and, and lean into that and be vulnerable. Um, otherwise, you will get eaten alive. Wow. I hate that. I'm a, this just makes me think I'm a writer and my major editor is my mother. And she's, <laughs> up mom. she's so brutal to me. She'd be like, this is terrible. So never have your mother edit you if you're a writer. Um, so clearly you can tell we all have no problem talking. We fill this space quite well, I think. Um, but be, that being said, we're coming to our end and I know there are people with a few questions, but what I'll tell you, just based on like even success and resiliency, just because we're a group of successful people, we are highly approachable. We are here for you today to come up and have a conversation with. I know people kind of get scared 
Um, if you're really terrified and like don't know, oh, I don't know if I could talk to Dara, come find me. I'll interrupt her conversation for you. <laughs> I've, I've interrupted. That's facilitating. I've, I've, I'll facilitate yeah. all day. I'm here all day working for you. Um, so, but I would like to thank uh, Susan Manifest. Susan's yeah. group has been incredible. Um, all the sponsors, everybody, uh, Kevin being here and uh, just really want, I think all of us on the panel really want to thank them for having us come in and get to speak with you guys today. So, appreciate it. Yeah.